Hello, welcome to this lesson in Mastering Statistics. Here we're going to work on hypothesis testing, but in a slightly different case. And that's kind of how the rest of this uh, set of lessons is going to go. We're going, we have already done hypothesis testing. We're doing testing on means when the sample size that we have collected for our testing is less than 30, 30 or less, okay? Now we're getting into a situation, now what we did before was what we called small sampling, when we have less than 30 samples. Here we're doing what we call large samples, which as you might guess is greater than 30 uh, samples. And this very, very closely follows what we've done when we did confidence intervals. We also had small uh, samples and large samples. It's the same sort of thing. So we use 30 as our kind of cutoff. Below that we use the T distribution that we've been using all this time. And then here now that we're getting into 30 samples or greater, or greater than 30 samples, we're going to be doing the normal distribution. Now if you remember back a long time ago, uh, I taught you, uh, you may not remember, but I taught you that the T distribution, it looks bell shaped, but the exact shape of it depends on the degrees of freedom. And that depends on the number of samples. Remember degrees of freedom is the number of samples minus one, N minus one. So if you have uh, a, a very small amount of samples, the curve is going to also look bell-shaped, but maybe not quite the same as it does if you have 30 or 40 samples. It turns out that as you have more and more and more samples for a T distribution, it looks more and more and more normal. So a T distribution looks like a normal distribution when you have a large number of samples. So that's why when we had what we call small samples, we had to actually use the T distribution because we didn't have enough samples so that the T distribution looks normal enough to look to use the normal distribution. I know that's a lot of words, but bottom line is when we have a small number of samples, the difference between a T distribution and a normal distribution is pretty pretty great difference. So we have to use the full-blown T distribution. When we get over 30 samples, it's okay to use a normal distribution because a T distribution looks like a normal distribution when you have a large enough number of samples. All right, so let me go through my list to make sure I say everything to you. When we have a large sample size greater than 30, we use a normal distribution for our hypothesis testing. Okay, and this is really because of what I just said before, because the T distribution approaches a normal distribution when you have large number of samples, greater than 30 is our cutoff that we use. Now, as far as the hypothesis testing itself, the actual method is basically exactly the same as what we've been doing before. We lock down the rejection regions, we calculate a test statistic, we see where the test statistic falls, and then we determine if we uh, reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject. So all of that stuff is really the same. The concept is really the same. But there is one difference, and that is because of the fact that we're using a, a uh, normal distribution, the test statistic is as follows. You, you remember before when we did a t distribution, we had t was equal to some stuff. Well now what we're doing a normal distribution, we use the variable z because that's the variable that we use. The z-score is a variable we use with a normal distribution, but in fact this should look very familiar to you. It's, it's uh, x bar minus mu over sample standard deviation square root of n. In fact this is basically exactly the same thing as before. Only thing I've changed is instead of calling it t, we call it z. So really um, that's why we introduce the t-distribution stuff first when we talk about hypothesis testing, because I can get over all of these details of what it really is, and you're kind of comfortable using it, and then when we get to large samples, I just tell you, hey, we're doing exactly the same thing, except we're using a normal distribution, so the chart you're going to use in your book will be normal distribution, and the test statistic is no longer a t-test statistic, because we're not using a t-distribution. It's z, because that's what we use when we talk about normal distributions. But on the right-hand side is basically what we've been doing before. Um, so this, all this stuff on the right comes from the sample data that you collect just like it did before. All right. Uh, now here's one fundamental difference between what we've done before and what we've done now. If you remember, I told you, okay, write down your information, write down a copy of, or a little sketch of the curve, and then write down your rejection regions. So you figure out, do you have a left tail test, do you have a right tail test, or do you have a two tail test? And you shade the tails. And then you find those values of t, and those values of t are basically the hurdles that you have to jump over to get to statistical significance to see if you reject or not. I'm recapping what we've done basically before. That's what we've done in the past. And for every one of those problems, we had to go into the t distribution and figure out what those values of t were that define our rejection regions, t sub alpha or negative t sub alpha, or if it's a two-tailed distribution, t alpha over two. We've done that many, many, many times in all the problems we've done. But you know, the reason that we had to find those uh, 
those values of T alpha for every single problem in the previous ones is because that T distribution, it totally changes shape depending on the degrees of freedom that you have. If I have a 15 degree of freedom problem, which means 16 samples, or if I have another problem that's 22 degrees of freedom, which means, you know, 23 samples, right, then those two are going to look bell-shaped, but they're going, the shape of the curve will be different. One will be steeper than the other. Because of the changing nature of the t-distribution, depending on the number of samples, I have to go find those rejection regions for every problem that I do. Because the t-distribution itself, the shape of it changes for every problem, depending on the number of samples I have. But now we're into the realm of large samples. It's always going to be greater than 30 samples, and I'm always going to use a normal distribution. A normal distribution is much simpler because it never changes. The shape of the normal distribution never, ever, ever changes. It's normal. It's constant. It doesn't change. It doesn't matter if I have 32 samples or 49 samples or 110 samples. I'm still using that normal distribution for all of these problems. So these problems actually get a little bit simpler. I don't have to go find these rejection regions for every single problem because that distribution doesn't change for every problem. I can kind of find them ahead of time and I can write them down for you. So let me go and do that. I'm going to write a little bit, a bit of information here and then after I get it on the board I'll explain the significance of what we're doing. All right. So here is a column of C that's basically a level of confidence. Here's alpha and here's one tail test and two tail test. Okay, so here's a column, here's a column, here's a column, here's a column. So let's take some common values. What would we do if we wanted a 90% confidence interval? 0.90 would be C. Alpha would be 1 minus this, 0.10. Now let's pretend that we were actually going to do this full blown. We're actually going to go find, do the hypothesis test for a large sample size uh, mean type of problem uh, here. So what we would do is we'd go, it's exactly the same as before. Alpha is point. Uh, point uh, one. So let me go down and skip down here for a second and just sketch something for you. Let's say this is the normal distribution. And let's say it was a right tail test. Okay, a one tail test, let's say to the right. So what I do is I take my alpha, just like we've always been doing in the past, and I say, hey, this is going to be alpha, which is 0 0.10. Okay, now this is no longer a T distribution. It's a Z distribution. So there's going to be a value of Z down here that's going to correspond at this point such that the area to the right is alpha. It's exactly the same as what we had for T, but now it's a normal distribution, which doesn't change. The shape of that thing doesn't change depending on the degrees of freedom or anything. That's only something that the T distribution has, you have to deal with. So for the T distribution, I had to go and look this up for the degree of freedom and find this value of T for every problem to define my rejection regions because the shape of this curve changes for every problem where I have a different number of samples. But here, if I really wanted to, I could go look in my table and I could go figure out the value of Z that gives me an area of 0.1 to the right. And it turns out that for a one tail test, this value of Z is going to be 1.28. If you go look in the chart, the value of 1.28, if you do the calculations, will give you an area of 0.1 to the right. Okay? That is never going to change. So if you're doing a one tail test at a 90% confidence or 0.1 significance, it's the same exact thing, the value of Z that you use down here for your rejection region is just positive 1.28. It always is. This doesn't change. Whether or not I have 35 samples or 42 samples or 69 samples, I don't have any degrees of freedom or anything like that in this problem. So this value of Z that gives me this area never ever changes. And that's why I'm going to tabulate this for you. Okay. What if I have 0 0.95? That's 95%. So alpha is 0 0.05. The one tail test is 1.645. That's a Z value, uh, a Z value of 1.645 here that's going to give me an area of 0 0.05 to the right. And it doesn't change depending on uh, degrees of freedom or anything like that. Some other common values, 0 0.98 would give me 0 0.02 for alpha, 2.05 and then 0 0.99, which is 99% confidence, 0 0.01, level of significance, 2.33, okay? 
Now this is for a one-tail test, and I'm, I'm writing these as positive values of z. So I'm kind of implying when I write it as a positive value that it's a right-hand test, because the, just, like every, just like the t distribution, this is centered at zero. These are positive values of z. These are negative values of z. So if I'm looking at a right-tail test, where alpha is 0.1, then I know that z, this boundary here, is 1.28, okay? But if I were doing a left tail test, if I were doing a left tail test, I know that my rejection region has to have a negative value of z, but everything is a mirror image, just like it is for t distribution. So I'm gonna put a negative sign in front of this, and I'm gonna put a negative sign in front of this, negative sign in front of this, negative sign in front of this, if I were doing a left tail test. So you have to know what you're doing and the little minutia of details, okay? Now I haven't done anything with this column yet because I wanted to explain what I'm basically doing here. If I have a two-tail test, don't forget what that is. A two-tail test is basically when you have something like this and you have an area over on one side and an area over on the other side. So you have two values of z, okay? But these two values of z that you have, they're always equal and opposite. If this is 1.5, this is always negative 1.5. And what you're doing is you're finding the values of z to give you the uh, alpha over 2 over here and alpha over 2 over here. So this is alpha over 2 and this is alpha over 2. So you can do the exact same thing. If you grab the normal distribution and you found different alpha over 2's and put them over here, you'd find a value of z and you would have a corresponding negative value of z. It turns out when you do all that, for 90% confidence, the two-tail test is plus minus 1.645. For 95% confidence, you've got plus minus 1.96. For 98% confidence, you've got plus minus 2.33. And for 99% confidence, you've got plus minus 2.575. And that's basically the table. So um, we're not going to do a problem in this section, but I want to under, for you to understand where this comes from because a lot of books will give this to you and a lot of students look at this and they're just like, well, well this is so different than what we've done before. Well, I'm, I explained all the details in the T distribution we've done before how we arrive at these boundaries and before you've learned from doing enough problems that what you figure out is you put your alpha here, your level of significance here and you have to find this value of T. Well, the only reason you had to find that value of T for every single problem is because the shape of the distribution changes depending on the degrees of freedom which is the number of samples. So if I run the same problem twice with different number of samples, I'm going to get, uh, I do the, have to prob do the problem twice because the uh, cutoff regions will be different if I have different number of, of samples because the shape of that curve changes. But with the normal distribution, when we get over 30 samples, we don't even have any degrees of freedom. Nothing changes. So what we do is we, I've done this work for you or your book has done this work for you. If you do 90% confidence the, and it's a right tail test, it'll be z is equal to 1.28. If it's a left tail test, it's negative 1.28 because it'll be the mirror image. If it's a two tail test, half of the area is in each tail, so it's plus minus 1.645. You could get all of these numbers yourself if you crack open your book to the back to the normal distribution and you scan through there and figure out the areas uh, and then look for the z values that correspond to the areas that we're talking about, the areas being alpha here. You could get all these yourself, but you have to be careful because remember the t distribution is defined for area to the right of t, but the normal distribution is always tabulated for the area left of z. So that is just a little bit weird. You kind of have to just kind of remember that. The z distribution, the normal distribution is the very first one you learned. You get the area to the left. That's what we've done way in the past. The t distribution is always area to the right. So when you're, if you had to do it all manually, you would have to take that into consideration when you find, find these numbers. But in reality, you don't have to find these numbers because 90, 95, 98, and 99% level of confidence are the most common that you'll see Certainly for all of the problems we'll do here, that's what we'll use. So really all you have to do is, when you get to a problem and it says you're doing 98% level of confidence or alpha 0.02, you just know that the Z cutoff is 2.05. If it's a right tail test. If it's a left tail test, it's a negative 2.05. And you don't have to fret about finding those values. You just use them. That defines your rejection region and then you just slide right on into finding your test statistic to see where it falls. So I think it's enough talking here. I think what we need to do is just, I'm going to leave this on the board. I'll leave this, um, I'll leave this, um, this chart on the board. We'll solve the problems over on the right hand side and so as you work the problems you can refer back to it and you'll see what I'm talking about. So follow me on to the next lesson. We'll, we'll work our first problem with 
hypothesis testing when we have a large number of samples testing hypotheses involving uh, means.